Are we ready? Let's go ahead and stand together. Why don't we get started? Father, we come into your house. <clears throat> you know, it's a holy time when we can be in your presence with your people. We thank you, Lord, for <clears throat> your great salvation, for your love for us, and uh, you're guiding us day by day, reminding us of who we are and reminding us of the call you've put on our lives. Lord, we want to renew that tonight. We want to recognize that you're the only thing that really matters and that we want to follow you with all our heart. So we dedicate this evening, everything here and everyone here, to you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste Of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior, heart and This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior, all the day. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, angels descending and bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Submission all is direct. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, I'm looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Amen. Why don't you take a minute and say hi to someone? Sir. Jesus. 
lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you. I need Born a rock and now I know I love you, I need you Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go My Savior, my closest friend I will worship you till the day we thank you tonight that we get to come into your presence the way we do Lord and I thank you that you are who you are Lord and we want to know you better Lord we want to understand you in a better in a deep deeper way Lord so we pray tonight Lord God that there'd be intimacy concerning the word of God that, Father, you teach us things that only you can. That you give us understanding by the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Father, we ask for your blessing, God. We know that's your heart. You want to bless us. So bless us through the Holy Word of God, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. We are in the book of Proverbs tonight. So if you have your Bibles, turn to me to Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs 21. Before we go there, put your hand there. Hopefully you're all there right now. I want to read a scripture to you. And it's in the book of James, chapter 3. Let me read it to you. And it gives the understanding of what real wisdom is. And it shows you the other kinds of wisdom that there are. Let me read to you. And it says this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first of all pure and peaceable, 
gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, of good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The reason I read that to you is I want you to understand that there are different wisdoms than just the wisdom of God. I want to remind you what wisdom is, because we're in the book of Proverbs, that's the book of wisdom. Wisdom is knowing how to apply knowledge rightly. Now, as we read in James, we see that the wisdom that comes from the world can be earthly, it can be sensual, and it can be demonic. The Bible says that the wisdom that comes from God is peaceable, easy to be entreated. It's totally different than the, the wisdom opposite of it, which we see in the world today. A couple points. The wisdom we see in the world today is destroying our nation. It's destroying people and people's lives. It is not only worldly, but it is demonic. When doctors that are educated throw away science and they tell you that someone wants to change their sex and will help you, will give you beta blockers and will make you into a, a man or into a woman opposite of what you are. God created men, God gave men the gender of male or female. And I believe that it's demonic when someone tries to change it. I believe that there's demonic activity behind it. But that is the wisdom that is demonic that's in our world and so prevalent in so many ways. When I see all the things that are going on in our streets, all the great pride week or month and year and every single day and I see all that garbage, it's just, it's so evil. There has to be demonic behind it. And then I, today I saw it again, just for about five minutes, and it reminded me of Sodom and Gomorrah and how God, with his wisdom, judged them. But you and I, have to be careful that we don't receive that kind of wisdom that's demonic. Because we don't want to offend nobody, we don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, we don't want to say anything against people. We all should be able to live the way we want to live. And I've heard too many times people who say things and agree with them that God says is an abomination to him. Now you and I, before we became Christians, all received wisdom, and probably all three, sensual, earthly, and demonic. For 27 years, I was not a Christian. For 27 years, I got my mind filled with wisdom that came from everything that you can think of. What I mean by that is from those three things. And what God wants to do, he wants to wash away that wisdom that we got from the world, from the demonic, and from the earth, earthly. And he wants to put the wisdom that God has in his word in our hearts so we can live by that. I have found it to be true that if you argue with God and you say, you know what? I really feel that that's okay when God says the opposite. You're wrong, God's not. When I go through the book of Proverbs, I've been through it so many times, God speaks to me and speaks to my heart and works within my heart and shows me many things. And I have yet to say to God, that's wrong. But let me tell you what has happened 
is things that I have been taught when I was younger have come up and I've faced those two things, the truth and the lie. And I've had to make my choice of whether I'm going to believe God and say yes and accept that wisdom and apply that wisdom to my heart and to my life and my circumstances. Or I'm going to say, well, I think what I know and what I've learned and I've experienced... is right instead of God. And it's not. So when we go through the scripture, especially in Proverbs, you're going to be confronted with things, even if you are a Christian and you've been a Christian for a period of time, you're going to be con confronted with wisdom that's from God or your own wisdom or things you've learned before. And God, through the truth, wants to set you free and bring your life into a place of blessing in that area, whatever it may be. Are you blessing others through the wisdom and counsel that God has given you to give to others? Some of you I know in here, your children are blessed because you've given them the wisdom that you got from God, and their lives have become blessed because they've made choices of taking your counsel. And we've even seen some of our children make bad choices and take the wisdom of the world and the demonic and see where they end up because of the choices they made. And that's on them. But as Christians, God wants you to have his wisdom. And it comes from this book we call the Bible, the inspired, infallible Word of God. And a lot of it comes through the book of Proverbs. So when we go through the book of Proverbs, to me it's very holy. It's very sanctified, so to say. It's kind of like coming in and kneeling because Proverbs is so important, and every book of the Bible is just as important. But it's so important for our lives today. We see so many things going on that are opposite of the truth, so we know, need to know the truth, and God teaches that through Proverbs. So let's go on the very first verse and hit a lot of areas. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. So he speaks literally about those who are in power are those who seem like they're in control. I want you to look at our world today. And if you look at it with open eyes and honest hearts, you'll say, our world is a mess. Amen? Amen? There's some serious problems that we've never seen before that are happening, and there don't seem to be any answers. There are men that are making choices that are leading our nation and leading other nations into things that are so sad and even evil even against everything God says, and they know it. And we can get to a place of looking at, at that and say, you know what? Nobody's in control. Everything is just a mess. Or a mess. But the Bible teaches different. The Bible teaches that the heart of a king, those in authority, those in the power, God can turn. And he talks about like rivers of water. And in those times when writing of this, there were sluices, they're called. And what they would do is they would get to the river and they'd put little canals like, and they would have these wooden things that they'd put down to stop it or slow it down. And they'd carve these canals and they'd go right to the water or, and to take it to wherever they wanted to go to the plants and they would water. That's how it worked. 
And what the Bible is saying is that's exactly what God does. God takes or is in control of the heart of the king. And when God wants them to turn it, their heart towards something or towards someone, God turns it. I believe this with all my heart. I believe this because I've seen God do it. And if I trust God's word when he says these things, then something happens to me inside. And let me tell you what it is. I can have peace. I don't agree with what's happening. It's sad and it's sick to see what's happening. But I know that overall, God's in control. And what that does to me as a Christian, it gives me peace and it gives me rest. It takes away the fear of the uncertainty, so to say. God will turn our influence like he did many people in the Old Testament. The heart of people who are in power. There is a story in the Old Testament about a man named Joseph. You all know the story well. How did Joseph get to where he got? God had promised him through a dream that he was going to be a powerful man and he was going to lead and his brothers were going to bow down to him. How did God do that? Oh, he put him in prison, put him in slavery. And then God put it on the heart of Pharaoh to bring him before him. And God put it in the heart of Pharaoh to make him the ruler over his nation, right under Pharaoh. All that was planned by God. All of that was put in the heart of Pharaoh. And in the scripture, there are many, many, many different things like this that have happened that the Bible teaches on. So can I believe tonight God in his faithfulness can take those in authority and those in power and turn their heart to where he wants them to make a decision of what's on his heart? Is God that powerful? Yes, he is. And God is that faithful. Now he goes on in the second verse. I like this scripture because it's true, and every scripture is true, but I just like what it says because I know me, and I know you. It says, every way of man is in right in his own eyes, but the Lord ways, or the word in the Hebrew is ponders the heart. I want to read a different translation to you. This is in the, called the message. This is in Proverbs 21, 2. It says, we justify our actions by the appearance. God examines our motives. Another translation says, people may think that they are doing what is right, but the Lord examines the heart. So what it's really saying at the beginning of this is that man's way, or the road that he takes, or the direction he takes, the journey, or even the moral character he chooses, is right. And that word means straight, are just, are proper. So a man thinks that what choices he makes is right. It's correct. In other words, what he's saying here is that we can justify anything we do. Why did you do this? Well, the reason why I did that is because if I didn't do that, this would have happened. So that's why I did it. You know, why did you sock your brother? Well, he came too close to me. If he wouldn't have came close to me, I wouldn't have socked him. My point is, and what the scripture is teaching is, that literally we can justify anything that we are doing that we think is right, even though it's not right. But the Bible teaches God weighs or it tests, the word means, the heart. In other words, he sees why and what the motive is of why you're doing what you are doing. God da looks down at my motives. God is always interested in not so much of what I do, but what motivates the action. Now, it is possible that a person have the total proper action, but the wrong motivation. 
in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible speaks this, that all will appear before the judgment seat of Christ in order that they might be judged according to their works, what sort they are. Now Jesus tells us that we'll definitely be judged according to, not what I've done, but what motivated me to do it. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 1, Take heed to yourself that you do not do your righteousness before man to be seen of men. For I say unto you, you have your reward. So what God does look at, he looks at why did I do it? What motivated me to do that? What motivated me to go over and give somebody standing on a street corner five dollars? What was my motivation? Well, I know him and I just felt like I needed to give him five bucks. I felt like the Lord told me to give him five bucks. I mean, that's a good motivation. Or I can say, well, my wife was with me in the car and she felt bad and so I did it because of her. But I felt pretty good after it. God's going to see our motives and they're going to be completely clear. My point is, is this. We have to make sure our motivations on why we do whatever God, or we feel God wants us to do is true, is right. In other words, I'm doing it because this is what God wants and I want to do it for God's glory. That's the key. I do it for God's glory. When I'm up here, I need to do this for God's glory. When our worship team's up here, they need to do it for God's glory. It's not for them. If they are doing it for themselves, then when they stand before God and I stand before God, and I'm judged, not in the sense of being sent to hell, but for what I did for God by the works I've done, then they'll be hay, wood, and stubble. They'll burn up. And I don't want that. So how do I make sure that my motives are right? David, in the book of Psalms 139, he said this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways, and see if there be any way of wickedness in me. You see, I don't know my heart, and you don't know your heart. Therefore, we need to ask God to search our hearts, to reveal to us if there is something that there is unlike in what God wants us to be in our motives. So God will show us, if we will ask him, God, why am I doing this? I have to be honest with you. I'm always honest with you that I know of. But there are times I've asked God, God, will you please show me why I did that? And God would show me, and he showed me every time. And I would say, this, on this time, I, I said, oh, okay. So my motive wasn't right why I did that. So God wants your motive right more than anything else. Now, verse 3, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. What he's really saying here, the way we treat people is important to God, and it's more important than going and giving God a sacrifice or an offering in the sense of an animal in those days. God said, sacrifice and offering, I would not. I don't care about those. What I want is a broken and a contrite heart, the repentant heart. God said, I will not turn away but I will, I have, but he spoke about the rejection of their sacrifices and offerings at that one point. He said, don't bring me any more. I'm sick of them. I don't want any more of your sacrifices. Your heart is in it. And the sacrifice is meaningless at that point. God says, don't offer. I don't want any more of those sacrifices. What I want is true repentance, true judgment, justice, mercy, and those things that God is interested in. So it's so important that we understand what God wants. Well, I gave you this, and I sacrificed this for you, God. And I said, no, I, want, I don't want that. 
I want you to be righteous with other people. I want you to be just and fair with other people. That's what I want. I want to read a different translation of that same verse. It says this, Clean living before God and justice with your neighbor means far more to God than, than religious performance. Now it goes on to the next one. It seems like almost every chapter we talk about this same problem or something similar to it. A haughty look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked are sin. So the first thing is a, it speaks about a haughty look or one that is lifted up. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm, that the, a haughty person would be one who thinks he's better because that would be a proud person. I'm better than you are. I think you've heard me emphasize this many times because this is in my heart and this is what the Word of God says, that there is no better person in this room than another. In other words, sinners saved by grace because of the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God, but all of us are sinners saved by grace. Now, you may be a little bit more polished sinner than others because you've been walking with God longer. And that's how it should be. And you should be nurturing the younger ones and ministering to them and teaching them. And yes, that's how it should be. But you're still a sinner. You might be an older and a mature more sinner. But you're a sinner saved by grace. And we should never make someone feel less than we are. Less than we are. Let me read a couple of scriptures to you with that same thought in the mind, talking about proud and haughty. Luke 1, 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. So someone who is proud, he has a lot of imaginations in his heart who he thinks he is, and he's not. 2 Timothy 3, 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boastful, proud, blasphemy, Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy. This is be the last days that men are going to be proud and arrogant. We don't need God. First Peter five five. Likewise, you younger, submit yourself to the older. Yea, all of you, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. It seems like I talk about this almost every week, don't we? This thing called pride. Now he goes on in verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. The Bible teaches that God wants us to have plans. And the plans that we have, God makes a promise. If we do them right and do them diligently, they will lead to plenty. The Bible teaches that God wants us to be patient in industry and we will be rewarded by increase. What he's talking about here, and we'll, see, we'll sew it together with the second part, but those of everyone who is hasty is surely to be to poverty. What God is saying is literally this. It takes time and effort. It takes diligence to build and to grow and to have. It doesn't come in a short period of time. It won't happen in a short period of time. But when we plan that and make plans and we diligently do it, God promises his blessings.
those who are hasty to be rich, those that are looking for a get-rich-quick scheme, this is a warning. Verse 6, getting treasure by a lying tongue is a pleasing fantasy of those who seek death. So these are people who talk their way into money or scam. Probably every one of you have dealt with a scam of something. It wasn't too long ago that I got a phone call from Africa. I don't know anybody in Africa. But the man from Africa said this to me. He said, I have some gold that I have, so I'm selling that I have to get rid of. I'm leaving the country. And he said, you can buy it for $800, and it's worth much more. And I said, and then my wheels started turning. I go, who is this? And he goes, I'm, all you have to do is send the money, and I'll send you the, the gold. And then when you think of something like this and you're thinking about all this money, and it was a few years ago, you think, well, maybe this is good. And then you come to your senses and you realize this is a big scam. When anybody wants to give you more, and I'm talking about outside the church, I'm talking, and even be careful with people in the church sometimes, because there are people in the church who do not know God. There are some who go to church differently. And I'm not saying anybody in this room or anybody that I personally know. But there are scammers also in churches. But if anybody says to you, I'm going to give you $10,000 for $1,000 today, you better run. Because they're trying to scam you. Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have ever been scammed? I bet you every single one of you have been tempted by somebody has been tempted you to, be, to scam you. And it's happening all over. I just heard yesterday or the day before that someone had $2,700 in their food stamps. And somewhere or another, they got all $2,700. They scammed them out of it. I don't know how they did it. They don't know. But that is really prevalent right now. The evil people, many evil people, are wiser than those who... Uh, are they wise? Put it that way. If they would use their evil for good, amen. They could do a lot of good things. But getting treasure by a longing tongue is a f fantasy, but the Bible speaks for those who seek death. In other words, death will come to them. They are going to die spiritually and physically. Now, the violence of the wicked will destroy them because they refuse to do justice. They willingly decline to do what's right and it will destroy them, the Bible says, violent. And some of the wicked, let me back up a second. When we think of the word wicked, we think evil men, evil women, evil, evil, evil. They're people who kill people and kill babies, and they do all kinds of things like that. That isn't necessarily what the word means in its context here. Wicked can mean people who do wicked things. There are a lot of things that are done that are wicked that people do that maybe aren't that wicked that we would put them in the box of the wicked, wicked, wicked. There are people today, we can call them and I'll call them, Antifa, Black Lives Matters, and groups like that that are totally against Christianity and totally against God, that are wicked, wicked, wicked. And they'll do violence 
and they wear their masks to hide their shame if they have any. But the Bible teaches they will be destroyed because they refuse to do justice. You know, a lot of these people we're talking about are well-educated people. They're not they're dumb people. They're just deceived people. Now he goes on. The way of the guilty man is perverse. But as for the pure, his work is right. That's pretty simple. Better to dwell, oh boy. Number nine, better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in the house shared with a contentious woman. Now, I want you to, I know when we read the scripture, probably we always think a wife. That's not what it means, really. What it's really saying, it says a woman, a contentious woman. A contentious woman can be a mother. It can be a mother-in-law. It can be a daughter. It can be a grandma. It can be any kind of, of those types in the sense of it's not just a wife. And because contentious means a brawling or a quarrelsome woman. It means we live in constant conflict with contention. No peace and no refuge. That would be hard, wouldn't it? Now, I want to remind you who wrote this. How many remember who wrote it? God by the Holy Spirit, but Solomon. Remember how many wives he had? Yeah, we had 700 and he had 300. So he had 1,000. So he must have had a couple of contentious ones. <laughs> you would think the guy would not marry so many so he wouldn't have that problem, but he did what he did. Now, verse 10, the soul of the wicked desires evil. He finds, his neighbor finds no favor in his eyes. So a wicked man cannot rest without planning and doing some kind of evil. Let me read a different translation. Evil people love to harm others. So I mean, when people harm others like that, like we see on the news and things like that, that that's evil? Yeah, that is. Their neighbors get no mercy from them. In other words, they could care less about their neighbors. When the, mother, when the scoffer is punished, the simple is made wise. But when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. So what it's saying here is, when somebody is corrected, those who are simple, which we should be, well, it can make us wise. So in other words, question, how well do you learn from the mistakes of others or the others who get corrected? Have you ever heard somebody say, I'm going through a trial? I think every one of us have. And I'll say to them, what are you, what, what's God doing? How come, what are you going through? And sometimes they'll share it and sometimes they won't. And when they do share it, I think to myself, after I've shared things with them, I think this. Boy, I don't want to do that. How can I learn from this? Because <laughs> I don't want to go through what they're going through right now. So it's important that we get instruction from correction that others go through are the punishment that others go through. Second half of that scripture says, but when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. In other words, the wise man uses every opportunity to increase his knowledge and his experience. Verse 12, the righteous God wisely considers the house of the wicked 
and he overthrows the wicked for their wickedness. So in other words, the Lord keeps his eyes on sinners that he may punish them at the fit moment. That's what the scripture teaches. Now, I want to make sure you understand that God is always in the place of bringing someone to repentance. God never in the Old Testament wanted people to die or be separated from him in any way. He always tried to lead them to repentance to come back to him. But then they got to a point of where he knew that was it, that they were end of, end of, of it, that they were never going to turn back. They were never going to change. Sometimes God would wait for 400 years with a country of people, a nation of people, and he wouldn't do anything. And then he'd finally say, okay, it's time, judgment. Now, verse 13, whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also himself be heard. Whoever shuts his eyes, or I'm sorry, his ears. What he's saying is those who are unmerciful. God cares about the poor. And God wants us to care about the poor. Notice what it says in the second half. He who shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. In other words, if I say nothing to the poor and help them when God tells me to, especially when you see a need and you just say, forget you, the Bible says when you ask God and you have a need, God's going to say, I'm not going to listen. That's what the scripture teaches. Well, I thought that God heard all prayer. Evidently, he doesn't. So, I really believe that God wants us to have a heart to help others. I believe that God has given us everything he has given us to be able to help others that have needs. Now, you also have to be wise in what you give and who you give. I don't think God wants you to, and this is my opinion, God tells you to do it, then do it. I don't stop on the corner when someone has a pack of cigarettes, smoking cigarettes, and he has a, a Starbucks coffee in his hand, and he says, anything will help. Our God bless you. He's asking for stuff. I don't believe that that is what we are to do. I've stopped, and I think I've shared this before, I've stopped and I've talked to them. One guy had a sign up, we'll work for food. I said, no problem, I got some work for you. He said, that's okay, thanks anyway. <laughs> so, but I really believe that God always wants us to help the poor. Now, a gift in secret, and that word gift really there in that context is talking about a bribe, pacifies anger, or turns or adverts anger. And a bribe, behind the back, strong wrath. In other words, if I bribe someone and he's angry at me, I give him a gift. It's going to kind of dissolve the strong wrath and remove it. I could say a lot about that bribe thing, but I'm not going to tonight. Verse 15. It is a joy or the just to do justice. But destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. So the righteous feels real pleasure in doing what is right. They have the answer of a good conscience. Verse 16, a man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Let me read you this word, wander. In the Hebrew, it means to go astray, to wander on the mind, to be intoxicated. It 
it is dangerous to begin on God's way of understanding and not continue on it. This is what happened to Solomon. Now, I say that with this thought in mind. We know there is nobody wiser than Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus contained all wisdom, period. The Bible teaches. But we know there was a man named Solomon who was the wisest man that we know of, according to the scripture. God gave him wisdom because he asked for it. But we also know that he went astray. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, he is in the flesh, he's walked away from God, and he's one miserable puppy. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And for about 15 years, he's away from God. He strays from God. He has seen God twice. And he's seen God's hand, he's seen God's blessing, he's seen everything that God said would happen, 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 happen. In fact, when he dedicated the temple, he said, everything that God said he would do, he's done. But he strayed from God. And he strayed from doing what God had told him and the understanding and the wisdom God had given him. He built all kinds of worship centers for false gods and even himself bowed to false gods. My point is, every day I walk with God. Every day I stay close to God. Every day, I pray more some days. I pray a little bit less. I read my Bible, I stay close. I have this relationship. My relationship with God is just more important than my relationship with my wife. I kiss my wife, I hug her, I tell her I love her every day, four or five times a day. She knows how special she is to me. I maintain that relationship. We talk, we communicate, we do all those things. It's the same thing with God, no different. If not, I begin to wander. I begin to stray in my mind, it says in, the, in Hebrews. In your mind, you start drifting. So you need, we all need to be careful concerning that. Let me read the scripture to you again. A man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Let me go back to Solomon just for a second. He did return after 15 years. Read the back page, the last page of Ecclesiastes, and you'll see what he says. He says, I come to my senses, and I'm paraphrasing. I've come to my senses, and I've realized all that is empty, all, this, all that I've accumulated, all that I've done, all the success, everything is empty. What's more important than anything else is my relationship with God, period. I want to read a different translation just to emphasize it a little bit more in the same scripture. This is a New Living Translation. The person who strays from common sense will end up in the company of the dead. Verse 17. Who loves pleasure will be a poor man, and he who loves wine and oil will not be rich. So in other words, what it's saying, and that word can, pleasure, can be sports. <laughs> That's what it partly says in the Hebrew. He who loves sports will be a poor man, partly. So what it's saying is, don't just love pleasure. Don't just spend all your money on doing this and doing that and going here and going there. And, and nothing's wrong with going places. That's not what it's saying. It doesn't say you can't live. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is be wise, okay? And be wise and frugal with what God has given you. Have discipline and denial at times. If you don't, you're going to end up wanting when you're older especially. Verse 18, the wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. What he's saying here in the scripture is that one day the righteous will triumph over the wicked. Please listen. When I was studying this, 
I really believe God reminded me of what's happening in our world today. It looks like the wicked's winning. It looks like those who are evil are controlling everything and making all the decisions in our nation. We're seeing all these things happening and they're mind blowers, really. And God makes this statement. One day, the righteous will triumph over the wicked. The Bible teaches that there's going to be a thousand year reign called the millennium. After the great tribulation, well, we're looking toward the rapture. Let's, let me give you a little bit of uh, what's in line. You all know it, just want to remind you. Next thing to happen is the rapture of the church. The snatching away in First Thessalonians 4. I've read article after article in the last couple of weeks about why people believe in, the, why the rapture is, should have happened even, <laughs> they believe. One guy makes a statement, and he's really a good teacher in the sense of prophecy. And he says, and he gave 15 points of why it should have happened already. He doesn't understand God. He's saying, God, it should have happened already. And he says, I'm saying that to let you know how close we are that the rapture is going to happen. And I said, it was a really interesting article. But the next thing to happen is the rapture of the church. After the rapture of the church, there's a seven-year period we call the Great Tribulation. It is God's judgment on the world. Read Revelations chapter 4. I'm starting on verse, I'm starting on the last verse of, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 5. Start there, better. To chapter 19. That is the Great Tribulation where God's wrath comes on the earth. God judges. But after that seven-year period, then comes the millennium. When the Bible says, the second return of Christ, when the church comes back with him church was in heaven with him for seven years and then the church comes back with him and judges and the world is totally different Jesus will judge from Jerusalem and so will the church everything will be like God wants it to be it won't be perfect because there will be still people who do not know God on the earth but the Bible makes a statement the righteous one day will triumph over the wicked, and this will happen, especially during the millennial. I'm looking forward to it. You're all going to be there and see it, just like I am. Verse 19. We're going to go quick to this one real quick. Better to dwell in the wilderness or the desert than a contentious and angry woman. Verse 20. There is a desirable treasure and the oil in the dwelling of the wise. But a foolish man squanders it. The wise man or the wise woman leaves a life of blessed, that is blessed by God. That wise person is frugal with all they, they have. Let me read a different translation to you. Wise people store up with the best food and olive oil, but a foolish person eats up everything he has. Verse 21, he who follows righteousness and mercy finds life. Righteousness and honor. So let's look at this scripture. He who follows or lives righteousness. In other words, live rightly the way God says to live. Not perfect, because none of us will live it perfect and without no sin or falling short, but lives rightly toward God and toward man. And he who is merciful, mercy is not getting what you, do, you deserve or not giving to others what they deserve, having compassion for them. He says that person who does that will find life will be long, prolonged and prosperous life and will find honor and righteousness. We'll be honored because of it. Verse 22. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and he brings down the trusted stronghold. I want to read you this with a commentator said on this scripture. 
He said this, the courageous, the courage and the strength of a valiant man cannot defend a city against the skillful counsel of a wise strategist. In other words, somebody who really plans can beat someone who has all these valiant men. Verse 23, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Is this a wonderful scripture or what? The Bible teaches us that we are to guard, and the word means to be a watchman over, to protect. our words that come out of our mouth. This kind of man who does this, this kind of woman, knows when to speak and when to be silent. I believe that we need to guard what we say and don't say everything that we think. It says here, he who does this, who guards his mouth and his tongue, keeps his soul from trouble, distress of conscience, and keeps his from trouble, from distress, straits. So words can bring trouble, can't they? I think sometimes at night, I think God will play back our day and sometimes he'll play back in our mind what we have said to another, whether they be good or whether they be bad. And if they're not good and they're not healthy, then what happens is we begin to be troubled within ourselves. You know what I'm talking about? We all do, don't we? And then we think, I don't know why I said it. I should have just shut up. And then we start calling ourselves names. You big dummy. I can't believe you're that stupid. So it's better just to make sure you guard your mouth. My wife's favorite scripture is, even a fool seems wise when he shuts his mouth. Verse 24. A proud and a haughty man, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. In other words, he's known by his actions. We're not going to stay on that one. We've done enough on that one about pride and haughty men. Verse 25. The desire of the lazy man kills him. For his hands refuse to labor. He covers greedy all day long what the righteous gives and does not spare. So the, this is really a four-part scripture, or these two scriptures together. The desire of the lazy man kills him. In other words, he, he wants, but he won't get up to do it, to get it. I want to have this. I want to have a new car. I want to have a home. I want to have a family. I want to have... I want to, I want I want and it's killing me. I really do want that. I really do. But he does nothing to be able to get what he really wants because he's too lazy. It kills him inside, too. Or his hand refused to labor. But he covets what others have all day. Oh, you should, they shouldn't have that. I should have that. If anybody should have it, it should be me. That guy who has it is up there doing what he needs to do to get it. But he doesn't see that. But it says in the last part, the fourth part, but the righteous gives and does not spare. In other words, a man who is righteous is generous and charitable and is a good steward of what God has given to him. Verse 27, we only got a couple more and we're done. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with a wicked heart or evil intention? That's pretty self-explaining. Self Verse 28, a false witness shall perish. But 
the man who hears him will speak endlessly. And it's talking about a testimony of law when it is in court. That that false witness will perish or die. But the man who hears him, or such as a lawyer, will speak endlessly concerning his lie and say things that agree with what this man says, even though it's a lie, an untruth. Verse 29, a wicked man hardens his face, are stubborn and bold, but as for the upright, he establishes his way. In other words, he's sympathetic toward others. Verse, let me read the same, uh, same scripture but a different translation. A wicked man is stubborn, but an honest person thinks careful about what he does, carefully about what he does. Verse 30, there is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. How many know that? How many understand that? Raise your hand if you do. In other words, no counsel can go against the word of God. Nothing. It cannot succeed. The horse is prepared for the battle. But deliverance is of the Lord. In other words, what it's saying is, that we, people need to prepare, and they prepare. And that's how war was. The horse was prepared. They were trained on how to fight in a battle against other horses. But really, the victory didn't come because it was just training. God decides who wins the war. There are many times in the scripture that we see that God's people were outnumbered by multitudes of people. Hundreds of thousands were against them, and they had 10,000 or 20,000. That's all they had, and God gave them the victory. So God is the one that brings the victory, not men. No. But deliverance is of the Lord. So let me ask you a question, and we'll end it with this. What are you trusting in for safety today? For your own personal safety. You say, well, I got a gun permit. The Lord says, no, I want you to trust in me. God desires for each of us today to trust in his delivering hand. In the Old Testament, God had many names. I think he had like 66 names. And some of them were Jehovah Jireh, God's provision will be seen. Jehovah Rapha, God healeth, heals. Jehovah Tzitkanu, God is my righteousness. Jehovah Shalom, God is my peace. And they go on and go on and go on. And all of them are names that were given to God in what God did in the lives of his people. My point is, is this. God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He doesn't change. And God will do or be who you need him to be. He wants to deliver you, and he's the only one that can. I really believe that God is the only one that can deliver someone from depression if they're depressed. Things may change, and while the depression will kind of subside, but God can completely deliver a person from depression. There's nothing that God can't do. Father, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you, God, that you are one who does desire to deliver us, Lord. That, Father, you are our shepherd. You do keep us. You do watch over us, Lord. You do lead us beside the still waters, Lord. And I want to thank you for that, Lord God. And I want to thank you for being faithful, Lord God, in all that you say you are and in your word, God. Now, Father, I know that each of us have gotten some wisdom from the word of God, Lord. And maybe, Father, there's even been a battle within us, Lord, for some, some wisdom we had before, Lord, that is different than yours. So we pray, Lord God, that we would take your wisdom and dissolve, Lord, that you would dissolve the wisdom, Father, that was earthy, sensual, or demonic, Lord God. 
I pray, God, that you would continue your great work in our heart, Lord. And thank you again for the word of God, the word of truth. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Any questions in our study tonight?